so much for joining us today. We've got a, a really exciting first look at the FSA Credential Level 2 that we're going to be sharing with all of you, and we are excited to get going. My name is Nikolai Lundy. I'm the Director of Education at SASB, and uh, I've got a little bit of a cold, so I apologize if you occasionally hear a cough or, or my throat's a little hoarse. I'm sorry about the timing on that. But we're going to have a great webinar, so let's go ahead and get started. Just a few housekeeping matters. These are questions that we get in every webinar, so we figure we'll just tackle them right up front. The first is that the deck and a recording will be sent out to anyone who has signed up. Um, so you'll get that by email next week. We'll also have it posted on our website. We've got a short survey at the end of the webinar. When you close out, that'll pop up on your screen. We'd love your feedback. We read all of that and process it as we consider future webinars. And uh, if you have questions, go ahead and submit that through the question feature. We will be looking at those and uh, answering them, some in the course of the webinar and some we'll put off at the end during a Q&A. So let's look at who we have uh, joining me on the webinar today. We've got two uh, people who helped write the Level 2 exam. We've got Tessie Patione, who's the VP of Responsible Investment Research at Domini Social Investments. We also have Tom Raymond, the Director of Environmental Sustainability at Formel Food. So I'm going to ask each of them to just spend a minute or two introducing themselves, talking about where they work and, and what they do. So Tessie, let's go ahead and start with you, Alphabet, and ladies first. Uh, can you please introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Nikolai. So my name is Tessie Patreon. I work at Domini Social Investments, which is a mutual fund company that is solely focused on responsible investments. Uh, I help manage the research department here. And prior to my time at Domini, I've worked both in traditional financial services. I started my career at Deutsche Bank, and I've also worked with New York Stock Exchange, and have a background in international affairs. So, and I've been at Domini for about eight and a half years now, and I've focused on really all industries. Uh, but currently, I have a particular focus on the pharmaceutical industry. Great. Thanks so much, Tessie. And we're going to hear much more about Tessie and the work that she does uh, as we go along. But Tom, if you don't mind introducing yourself uh, to the whole group. Sure. My name is Tom Raymond. I'm in the Director of Environmental Sustainability at Hormel Foods. Uh, they have a, about 25 years of experience in the environmental field. Uh, most of that was Honeywell prior to joining Hormel Foods about 10 years ago. Uh, my background is in both engineering and uh, law, which uh, has, has been guiding my career all along. Uh, in my current job, we, uh, we focus on environmental compliance, environmental uh, engineering work, uh, and sustainability work uh, in large part since the mid-2000s, and work closely with our corporate communications teams and, and other subject matter experts throughout the company on corporate responsibility matters. And, and at Hormel Foods, it's an exciting time. We're actually celebrating our 125th anniversary as a company this week. And with that long history comes a, a long journey, and it's a journey that uh, we continue to carry forward on sustainability, and I'm proud to be a part of it. That's wonderful. I didn't know about that anniversary. I'm sure it's an exciting time to be there. Thanks for sharing, Tom. And again, we'll hear, both, we'll hear from both of our experts as we go along. Um, Let's take a quick look at the agenda, just so that you know what we'll be talking about today. First, we're going to do a brief overview of the FSA credential. Um, then we're going to do a look at the Level 2 and Level 1 exams, looking at the differences and comparing how they relate to one another. That will give us a chance to start diving a little bit more into the Level 2 itself, looking at the curriculum, the exam, other details. Uh, and then we're going to take a look at what the first cohort of credential holders will be a part of what they'll be able to enjoy as uh, the early bird uh, for the FSA 2 exam opens uh, just tomorrow. So we'll have Q&A uh, both throughout the program, but then also at the very end. And before we get to uh, kind of the meat of the agenda, we want to get a sense of who is on the webinar. So we're going to pull up a poll question. Um, and it's just about your familiarity with level one. So it's ask, and you should be seeing that on your screen. We're going to ask you to just fill that out. Very quick question. 
It's about whether you've taken the exam for level one, signed up but haven't taken it yet, or you have not signed up yet. So we'll give everyone a moment to answer and then we'll look at uh, who we have on the call. Okay, so just another couple seconds before we close that out, and we'll take a look at uh, who we have. So get your answer in if you haven't yet. Okay, so the results should be showing up. So it looks like we've got about two-thirds of you have already taken the level one exam. You're very familiar with it. That's great. So we've got 10% who have signed up but have not completed. And then we've got another quarter of you who have not signed up yet. So we've got a good mix. That's great. That's exactly um, uh, what we wanted to know so that we can cover the right amount of information over the course of the next hour. So let's take a look at, just very briefly, since most of you are all already familiar with this, uh, about what the FSA credential is. Um, and I'm going to actually ask Tessie and Tom to share a little bit about their connection. Uh, to the credential. So let's start with Tessie. How is it that you uh, have interacted with the level one exam, Tessie? Can you share with everyone? Sure. So I was actually part of a special committee that reviewed the level one exam and helped set the pass-fail level. And so one of the great things about the FSA level one is that I took all versions of the ultimate exam and really got a sense for what what the test takers were expected to know. So it was really about learning about the principles and essential concepts of SASB. And it was a really interesting experience for me, for someone that's been in the field for eight and a half years, to understand where there's overlap between what I already know and what SASB also brings to the table in, in terms of looking at companies and evaluating them. Great. Tom, your experience has been a little bit different. You signed up and took the exam as a test taker. So do you want to share a little bit about what motivated you and, and kind of what you got out of that? Sure. Uh, the motivation is actually uh, pretty deep, and it goes back to how many questionnaire sets we receive as a company on corporate responsibility metrics and information, how many uh, indexing systems we respond to. Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot, and it uh, is quite a, bit of, uh, quite a bit of effort out of our group to respond to those. And we look in trends and disclosure, and as a company, I, we feel that these trends are, are starting to move towards more of the consistent uh, and comparable metrics uh, on the, the SASB, uh, SASB mission. And I guess we consider uh, ourselves early adopters of that mission and, and hope, to, hope to build that consistency between metrics analysis uh, uh, so everyone gets the information uh, that they need and in a consistent and comparable fashion. Uh, so with that, as, a, as an organization, uh, there was actually three of us that decided, hey, we need to, we need to understand more about this ASB uh, and level one exam made a lot of sense to us as a method of doing that. So uh, three of us, myself, our communications uh, manager who deals with corporate responsibility and one of our supply chain uh, experts in purchasing, uh, the three of us all took the exam. and. I think we did learn a lot through the process, uh, very robust uh, testing, and it, it did help us gain a, a much higher level of understanding on the SASB approach. So as you can see, thank you, Tom. As you can see, we've got two people who are intimately familiar with this and really um, have seen kind of behind the scenes, especially for this level two exam that we're going to be talking about. So just as a, a quick highlight to make sure everyone's on the same page, since some of you have not signed up for level one, the FSA credential, it's a professional certificate program. There's two exams, and it really focuses on developing expertise in the materiality of sustainability information. It's at the intersection of corporate sustainability, finance and investment analysis, and security law. So it's really bringing all these pieces together and showing how it's relevant to uh, kind of the current state of sustainability and also where we see this field moving. So we've had about 300 uh, people sign up for the level one so far, it's primarily investors, corporate sustainability professionals, consultants, and increasingly over the last uh, half year or so, there's been much more uptake in finance and accounting backgrounds. And this was designed to appeal to that broad set 
of professionals, and that's who we see signing up and taking it. So no more of the overview. Let's start to dive into the details, look at the differences between level one and level two. And just on terms of how they differ, level one, as uh, both Tom and Tessie mentioned, is really about foundational knowledge. It's about setting the groundwork with the context, the facts, the overarching themes that really uh, uh, kind of guide sustainability accounting. And as a result, the exam is what I call mix and max questions. They're all related to the curriculum. They're all related to the learning objectives. But one question is not necessarily related to the question that follows it, and so on and so forth. You can kind of mix them and match them, and it'd still be the same exam. So level two differs from level one in those three key ways. First, it's much more about your advanced skills. It's really about a methodology for analyzing and understanding sustainability information that has material impact on a company's performance and value. And so the exam, as a result, has a much different feel. There's a set of case studies, and each case study has its own associated questions. And so you kind of get information about a particular industry, about companies in that industry, and then you have three to six questions asking about that case study, and then you move on to another case study. So a very different feel with that exam, much more about the analysis. Now, these were designed with the same audience. They were designed as one and two complementary pieces. Um, and it's really about the professionals who need or want to use material sustainability information to better understand the company's opportunities, its risks, and the impact of sustainability on the operating performance or the financial value. So um, that is really the overarching uh, uh, kind of value add for the FSA credential, but the way that level two provides that introduction and level level one, sorry, provides that introduction, level two builds on that, uh, really serves to meet that need. So um, let's hear a little bit, you know, Tom and Tessie, you both had different experiences with level one. You've also had uh, a very intimate experience helping write the exam for level two. I'd love to get your perspective on the differences. Let's start with Tom this time. What do you think? Uh, do you have anything else to add about what's difference between level one and level two? Well, I think in in terms of uh, of the two exams, level one obviously provided some great uh, great background information on on sustainability metrics and identifying uh, industry level disclosure topics uh, and and the components of sustainability standards and and the application of them. Level two certainly takes the application to a very high level. Uh, uh, again, not it moves away from the traditional question answer format to more of the case study and then the questions following that a series of questions on the analysis of that case study so it really gives the uh, it really gives the test taker an opportunity to to look at the uh, information provided and then apply that in a real world sense uh, to the organization's uh, opportunity and risk in the question set so it is a it is more reading uh, in the level two exam uh, and then application of what is in that case study to a series of, uh, of what I think are very uh, close to real life uh, scenarios. Great. Um, painting that picture I think is really helpful for, for people to understand what to expect. Tessie, is there anything else you would add in terms of what you've seen as you've gone through this? I mean, I think that one of the things is I'm coming from the research analyst perspective. I spend a lot of time analyzing companies, and this is much closer to that work And that in level one you have that foundation, you have the knowledge, and you have a framework, but this is much more about how you apply that framework, how you actually use it to, to determine whether, whether how a company is performing, to, to use SASB's industry standards to really get a sense of a company's performance, about whether there are risks and opportunities related to their performance, about whether their performance on these metrics affects the valuation. So it's much more, it's much more closer to the work that an analyst does. And because of that, I mean, obviously the ask is a lot higher. And I think that that's really the idea of, of level two, to really get a sense to, to examine how well the test taker is able to understand this methodology and apply it. So um, 
Thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm actually going to go back to, to kind of both of you, and, and specifically you, Tessie, first with a question that we've got from the audience, which I'm going to combine two questions here. How necessary um, is it that somebody has experience in investment analysis and portfolio management, um, and, and even kind of more so, how much math and advanced math is needed um, for part of level two? Can you can you share your perspective on that? Sure. There's some math, obviously, but I would say I mean, you don't really need very advanced math. I don't think this is something that you would only be comfortable with if you've, if you've previously taken finance classes or if you've previously built a valuation model. I think that that's something that's not required for the exam, but of course there is some math. There are some areas where you're thinking about normalizing information, where you're thinking about analyzing trends. And for that, you need some math. But I would not call it advanced math at all. And Tom, you, you um, as you shared your background, you haven't necessarily worked on the investment side. But you were very much a part of building this, as well as others who don't have investment experience. How would, how would you um, weigh in on, on kind of that perspective? I, um, by education and by my background, I, I deal with some heavier, heavier math and calculation. I would I would agree with Tessie. This is not the heavier math. It's it's heavy on on analysis and with some basic mathematical skills applied as to normalization and and uh, numeric comparison. Uh, it is definitely a, a, a the skill set challenge for me coming from more of a science background was definitely the the uh, analysis side of the equation. So looking at that case study and and extracting the information out the the sustainability. Uh, metrics that are applied to each question set, uh, that it's not the math, it's picking out and evaluating which of those metrics are, are going to help you reach the conclusion. Great. Thank you so much, both of you. I think that the, the key term that we keep hearing is this analysis piece, which I want to distinguish from um, something else, which is the level two exam is not about saying that there's only one right decision that a company or investor would make. It's really about understanding the information in front of you. I like to think of it as if you're translating a document. You might have three different translators. They're looking at the same source material. They can all understand it. You might end up with slightly different versions. You might end up with slightly different presentations of what's being translated. But ultimately, they understand the information in the same way. And that analysis, that understanding, is really what we're getting at and not trying. And we've stopped short of saying, and therefore, this company should make this strategic decision or this investor should make this investment decision. So that's one key piece of the level two. Let's take a little bit closer look at the curriculum. We've got some more questions coming in. And I think we'll be able to answer some of those as we go through. First is, what specifically then do you learn? So there's really one overarching theme, which was that candidates who go through the level two curriculum and, and uh, pass the exam should gain an enhanced analysis of a company's performance and value through material sustainability information. It's about that additive enhanced understanding. And that is beneficial for those working within the company, trying to understand their own performance, trying to understand their own strategy, and those outside trying to analyze the company either as a consultant or investor. And so we broke that down into three key skills. Identifying how a company's operations or operating context influence the materiality of sustainability issues. Then comparing peer companies' sustainability performance using normalization, additional context, and then evaluating the connection between performance on SASB topics and financial value. Now, one person is asked, is there going to be a study guide like there was for level one? Yes, absolutely. There will be a study guide that walks you through examples of how to think through this information and analyze it in a similar way. We also uh, kind of have somebody asking about um, continuing education credits, specifically CPEs for accountants um, as part of the curriculum. That's actually something we're still in process of trying to work through with the AICPA. They have very strict regulations and requirements around self-study programs like this. So unfortunately, we don't have an answer for that, something we're certainly going to be working on. Um, and one question was, will we learn how to incorporate SASB measurements into financial models? Really, 
we stop short of going so far as to say this is how you would adjust um, a, or this is how you would build a financial model like a DCF or something like that using SASB metrics. But really more about understanding where those impacts might play if you're looking at growth projections, book value impact, cost of capital, things like that. Um, specifically kind of on that last question, is there anything you would add either Tom or Tessie about kind of where this starts to tie into trying to build financial models and, and where the curriculum does and doesn't go? This is Tom for my – oh, go ahead, Tessie. Go ahead, Tom. I was going to say, for my my background is not in, in that world. I, I, I don't view it as building the financial models, but, again, that's not my background and, and forte, so I'll defer to Tessie. Sure. I mean, I think that the thing is it's much more about if this happens, if the company's performance changes on this specific metric, what's more likely to be affected? Is it that the company's book value is going to be affected? Is it that their liabilities? Much more, and I'm, I'm literally repeating exactly what Nikolai just said, but it's much more about conceptually how you think of the, the cause and effect here than a very specific, then I need to adjust my model down 5%. Then I need to, to change the cost or the, the target price I have on this stock. It's not that. It really is it's more about can you understand that if this metric is being affected, really affects the company's brand? If it affects the company's brand, does that affect some of its book value because, or its intangible assets? It's, it's much more, can you take this through line all the way through than uh, adjusting a, a, press, a target price or anything like that? And I think that when you read the study guide, when you read all of the materials, you'll, you'll, it's very clear to understand how or why this certain metric ha has all of these effects. And I think it's, it's all part of this, this idea that we want to very clearly communicate that all of this stuff that we look at as analysts from Tom's perspective that it has value in it and it has both benefits and risks, opportunities and risks to, to how companies perform. So it's not, I need to adjust the model this way or another. And one other thing that I'd like to um, uh, kind of answer that just came up uh, in the questions is, is whether or not you need to, whether you'll have access to the industry standards. And um, the case that you actually outline the information you need about a given industry. Nobody is being expected to know all 79 industries or have some level of familiarity with it. It's really about here's the information in front of you that you might have in front of you if you're looking at the SASB standards or briefs um, independently outside of an exam scenario. So here's the information you have. How can you understand what that's telling you? So um, nobody's being asked to uh, understand all those intricacies for every industry. You're given the background information and then asked to uh, understand what the implications are. So. I want to spend just a moment, because this is a question we, we get periodically, is about how did we arrive at the curriculum that um, we ended up with? And so there, there was a very specific process, and this was really guided by um, what we've learned uh, working with a test development company that has been in the business for decades. And so we started with this very uh, uh, early ideation phase. This was back in um, uh, Q3 and Q4 of 2015. Um, where we, we kind of have initial uh, questions around do, should we have specific changes to evaluation models? Should we have people um, doing this or that with the curriculum? What's really essential for being a, a FSA candidate? And that process was informed by over 20 reviewers um, outside of the organization who really said, you know what, this would be really helpful, this would be valuable for the work that I do, this is less applicable. So we took that and arrived at this kind of clear scope of what was uh, inbound within the curriculum that was then executed by some of our sector analysts uh, who have the deep industry knowledge at SASB, as well as these uh, 14 subject matter experts of which Tom and Tessie are a part of. And they then helped build out the study guide, build out the exam. So um, the people that were part of that review, the subject matter experts, they're the same backgrounds, the same type of professional expertise that this was designed for, and that reflects the people who are already taking the level, the FSA credential exams. Um, 
And I want to I want to get a little bit of perspective from Tessie and Tom because you came into this process once we had that that scope it was already defined, and so you had to go through your own uh, experience to come up with interesting or valuable case studies that would be relevant to test takers as they're going through this. And 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 uh, as Tom said, I think um, you know appropriately lifelike um, as you can expect in the exam. So. Let's start with Tessie, I suppose. How did you go about doing that? What was the way in which you thought about building these out um, that could be uh, useful and, and applicable to these, to these candidates? Well, I think that I, to some extent, I borrowed from real life. I mean, I've been doing this for quite a long time now, and so there were some scenarios that came into play that I thought would really illustrate some of the points or some of the, the objectives, really, of the exam. So oftentimes, I I spent out a lot of time at first really trying to understand and making sure that I really understood what we were aiming to examine. I spent a lot of time with the study guide and, and understanding the content. And then I took a little bit from real life, added where I thought would be helpful. A lot of this was about making sure that we drew out the, the context. It was really all about the context to make sure that we put, that I put together cases, and that I put together exam items, that really helps evaluate the connection between the SASB metric and financial impact on sustainability performance, on what it looks like with respect to the industry and its peers. It was a really involved process given that the framework was already in place. So I, I think a lot of the time was really spent internalizing the SASB standards and then trying to make sure that I was writing to that. I don't know if that's especially clear, but well, I think what I really drew out of that um, was this idea that you were drawing from your experiences, um, and I think that that um, is kind of the best indication of, of what people can expect um, with uh, the level two. Tom, your experiences are probably somewhat different, or your your career background is different than Tessie's. You bring something different to the table. How did you go about um, uh, kind of going through that same process of developing the case study? You know, with the background being different, uh, some of our approaches are very similar. Uh, we, I started with uh, looking at a learning objective and tying it into the industry standard that I'm most familiar with uh, through my background. And then from there, uh, using the industry standard to build a, a, that scenario that is very realistic to the, and applies to the learning objective that, that I was trying to write the question to. And, and in that process, there were certainly uh, SASB metrics that, that are either not in my background or are not in my subject matter area. So what I did is, is reached out to folks that I knew to make sure that the information I was putting down was as close to real life uh, metrics and analysis as possible, uh, given, uh, given the test writing. So I, I drew a lot of experience there early as, as we went through the process. The process was so rigorous. I, I think it uh, as we started to progress in, in case studies and question writing, we were able to take that real life experience and, and, and apply that to other industry types and, and get the same result. Uh, but it was all focused on learning objectives and trying to write trying to uh, write from the industry standard a, a realistic scenario that, that can really help the learner demonstrate knowledge on that objective. And, and thank you, uh, Tom. And, and I'm, I'm so glad to hear that both of you really uh, use that same approach um, because I think that's what makes level two different um, from level one, but also really value add as well for candidates. So um, we're going to take a look at, at the details of the exam, the number of questions, things like that. I know we've got some questions about that from the audience that have come in. But before we do, let's take a look at the study guide. Um, it's about 140 pages. There's three key sections. They more or less map to the three key skills that we talked about earlier. It's really about identifying the sustainability factors um, that are specific to a company, um, being able to compare peers in the industry, and then determining the value impact. The, case, the study guide really does a lot of simulation of examples, kind of simulate the type of thinking that you'd see in the case study. So what I did was I took kind of a screenshot which you see to the right here, um, which explains here's the industry, here's the topic, here's what the metric is, 
and then start to look at, okay, let's look at a couple companies that we've just either, um, you know, used lifelike data from that resembles uh, already disclosed data or data that kind of resembles what um, our industry experts know uh, is reasonable. And then let's start understanding what that uh, information, how you can understand that information. And so there are, I don't even know, dozens upon dozens of these throughout the study guide that really help the learner familiarize themselves with how this happens in practice. Um, and I am, I really love these examples. I, I'm just so excited for people to start digging into it and see kind of how this applies um, and can be done in practice. And so the study guide is all there to help make that feel real, help those skills um, uh, get refined so that when it comes to the exam, the candidates are prepared. So uh, let's take a look at what is involved with the exam itself. So there are 75 questions associated with 10 to 15 case studies. Now, it's similar to a level one exam, similar to any other exam that you take out there, CFA, CPA, SAT, GRE, all of those. There are some questions that are scored and count for your pass-fail score. So we'll have 60 questions that count for your pass-fail score, and some that are unscored, and those are the extra uh, 15 or so. And there's really two types of exam questions, and this is the same as you'd expect with level one, or the same as you encountered with level one if you took that, where you have a multiple choice single answer, so it's just choose one that's out of A, B, C, or D, or E, or F, and there's just one right answer. But you also have multiple choice, multiple answer, where some of these issues, there's kind of two uh, factors or, or two um, ideas at play that, that would be correct, or three even. And so out of these four or five or six options, which two are correct, which three are correct? Um, and uh, they're, just as in level one, level one has the majority in that first option, the single answer, one correct uh, choice. Um, but about 35-40% were the multiple answer. That was the case in level one. It's about that same for level two. Um, we have a two-hour time limit, and it's proctored uh, in the same way as uh, the um, uh, first exam were, where you can go to over 350 test centers in the U.S., or you can take it online, whether you're in the U.S. or abroad. Uh, um, with a webcam, somebody watching you, making sure that you don't have study materials, that you're not looking at a phone or going to the bathroom or things like that. So, um, you know, kind of one other set of questions for both Tom and Tessie to, um, you know, help everyone on the call understand what they might be able to expect. You know, building out the exam was really where your attention was focused. Um, and I think it would be great to hear, and we'll start with Tom, what were some of the skills you were trying to assess, or, or what did you want to make sure test takers could do? You know, if you, if you can remember a certain type of question or set of questions that really shed light on, on what somebody might expect, that everyone would certainly appreciate hearing that. Sure. I guess I think in two general groupings, uh, one skill set is to evaluate a company's performance uh, with the SASB metric over the course of, of time, say from year one to year two to year three. Uh, and that may be analysis on the sustainability metric or maybe analysis on sustainability versus financial impact, but an assessment of the company's performance over time. Uh, the second largest grouping is an analysis between companies. Uh, so that, that large question set's looking for that same analysis, but comparing the scenarios for, say, company A, B, and C, uh, who each might have a little different uh, uh, background as an organization and scope as an organization, but the metrics are there. So how does the comparison of those metrics, both sustainability to sustainability and sustainability to financial, how do, how do those analysis take place? So it's, a, it's a, in my opinion, a, a good mix of those two type approaches in the questions that I try to approach and, and that I've seen in the test questions. Tessie, would you um, have anything else to add or, or something that, that um, uh, you might kind of share that reflects what people might be able to expect or, or what you were really getting at when you were writing those questions? Sure. When I was writing the question, I was really 
trying to assess whether a candidate could use the metrics to gain insight. I mean, I think, you know, we, there have been a lot of conversations about materiality, and, and a lot of this is around materiality of these factors, but it's all about being able to interpret that. So now, if I give you a metric and it says this, what does that really mean about the company's performance? That's really, that's what I tried to write about each question. Like, can you use this data? Is it, do you have to change it in any way? Do you have to normalize it? Do you have to, what do you have to do to it to make this useful for you? And I think that's really the key there. It's about, as Nicola said, you're not going to memorize every industry standard information booklet. But it's really presented with these factors. How do you use them in the best way? How does it help you gain insight into how a company is performing? That's really what all of my questions were about. I mean, very different versions of that. But it's how do you use this framework that's in place and, and, and help it look at the external context, look at internal company versus company. How do you use this to make a decision about a company? And from my perspective as an analyst, that would be, would be what is most helpful, and that's really what I tried to get at when I wrote questions. So, you know, as, as you hear these themes, it, it's really kind of all about that, being able to understand the company's performance, that, that analysis piece, and, and then leaving, stopping short of saying, and therefore I recommend this sort of decision or, or this sort of strategic action. So that's really uh, what you should keep in mind or, or I think a key takeaway of what to expect. When you, when, you, when you think about this webinar title, level two, what you need to know, I think that's one of the key things that, that is the, the take-home piece. But we've got a couple of questions in here um, about what the expected pass rate is for level two. So um, the way that this is all going to work is that we, and, and Tessie mentioned that we did this for level one, um, is that the pass rate is determined once we have uh, about 150 to 200 test takers take the early bird version of the exam. Um, that data helps us run a psychometric statistical analysis to determine which questions are valid, which questions are fair, uh, which questions are really reflective of uh, how you expect the exam question to perform. If it's too hard in the sense that people are getting it le correct less often than they would guessing randomly, uh, or if it's too easy, that's not really appropriate for this caliber of exam. If there's no correlation between whether or not somebody gets question 10 right and they get other questions on the exam right, it's probably not an indicator of their expertise. Maybe they just guessed it right, and if that happens a lot, um, then that's also not a good question. So we actually go through a whole process once we have kind of initial pilot of test takers where we analyze the results, run through some kind of um, statistical, mathematical models, and then bring in a group of uh, new subject matter experts to evaluate and determine an appropriate pass-fail score. And really, uh, and Tessie can testify to this, we never share with anybody, if you choose this as the cutoff score, if you say that the 75% of the questions have to be answered correctly, you don't then know what the pass rate is. You don't know if that means 90% of people pass or 60% of people pass, because we're not really designing this to say that, oh, only a certain number of people are going to pass. Anyone who has the knowledge needed to pass the exam will pass based on that whole process. And if it's 90 or it's 60, that's really independent of what uh, the exam development uh, process is meant to tease out. So um, uh, what we saw with the level one exam was, uh, I'm, I'm sorry I don't have this off the top of my head, high 70%, just under 77%, my colleague says, uh, who passed through that, through that process um, with level one. We don't know what it's going to be for level two, and that's mainly because we're not trying to uh, calculate or orchestrate a certain pass rate. It's really not about making sure that certain people fail. It's really about making sure that uh, people who have demonstrated that they have the knowledge, that they uh, are able to um, validate that with the credential. So hopefully that provides some insight there. Um, let's take a look at some of the preparation tips. Now the number one resource that's going to help for students taking the exam is the study guide. You get that when you register for the exam. It comes through email. You get it through a PDF. 
Um, and that's going to be really the, 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 the bulk of where you're going to be able to benefit in studying. There's also some additional materials that can be helpful for somebody as they're going through this. There's a candid handbook. It's really more or less the same document that was existed for those who have used the Canada Handbook for Level 1. It's really about the, the logistics and the details you need to know as a candidate. Um, now, there are also going to be sample questions. So for Level 1, there were sample questions. Um, we actually heard from early bird test takers last time that there weren't um, as many sample questions as they would have liked. So we, we tripled the number um, that were offered. Um, so we're going to make sure that we offer a substantial number this time. Um, but to make sure that those are, are valuable and reflect what the exam is, our, our first priority is making sure the exam is finalized, which is, which is kind of the process we're in now. Within two weeks, two and a half weeks, we'll have those sample questions out for everyone um, so that they can use those. So it'll be at least three case studies with probably about five questions on each of those case studies, maybe a little bit more. Um, and so that before, and this will all be available before the first exam can even take place. And I'll get into those timing details later, but you'll have sample questions that get you familiar with what to expect. Another thing that we want to try that we haven't done with level one, but we got some feedback and we want to be your sponsor to that feedback. So we're going to do a little experiment um, with a kind of online study group. Um, there's a tool called Our Campus. We'll be rolling this out. Anybody who signs up will make sure that they have all the details and, and can log in. And we're going to have kind of this online discussion board study group. It's going to be voluntary. No need to, nobody is, is being expected or required to sign up. Um, it's also not going to be moderated. We're not going to use this as a, a way to kind of get, it's not a, a, a course where somebody goes in and, and gets tips from a former test taker about how to ace the exam. It's really about an opportunity for other test takers to have a community to be able to discuss questions and ideas, um, and we're not going to be uh, in there moderating. Um, we'll certainly answer questions that people have, but it's really a forum for, for fellow test takers to be able to talk to each other. Um, that's actually something we heard from a few different people that they wanted to have access to, so we thought we'd try it, um, and uh, it works well with this, this uh, limited pilot group. And the last thing is, is for uh, the day of the exam that can be stressful. You want to make sure you have everything in a row. So we've got uh, kind of final reminders and, and tips for what to expect and, and how to make sure you go in uh, with all of the logistics handles so you can focus on just doing well in the exam and, and not worrying about anything else. This was particularly helpful for people who are doing the remote online proctoring with a webcam and everything like that. It requires software that kind of takes over a computer so you don't have access to other materials. If you use a work computer or something else, uh, sometimes there's, there's firewalls and other things that, that get in there. So you, we recommend doing some diagnostics and, and uh, kind of uh, talking to um, uh, your tech department if you're using your work computer. We've got it all laid out. We actually make it fairly straightforward. So you've got a how-to guide so you're not stressed about it. But it's really helpful for people to look through that. So that also kind of helps with final preparation tips. Um, so let's, uh, I want to, you know, kind of probe the audience with one more poll question um, to get a sense of uh, kind of the extent to which people plan on using a study group. Um, because this will help us kind of uh, make sure that we have the right size materials in there. So. Um, there's a question here, will you join a digital study group and, and we're still going to offer it even if only two people say yes. We just want to get a sense to make sure that we are prepared um, for kind of the size of, of what might be expected. So there's just a question in there um, about whether you're likely to join something like that. Again, voluntary, not moderated, chance to talk with other test takers. So let us know and um, we'll give you a few more seconds to, to input your answer. So the, we still have people answering, so we'll give you another about five seconds or so. Okay, so 
Um, we're going to close that and take a look at the results real quick just so that all of you know also on kind of what to expect if, if you're trying to, to join the study group. So um, we've got a wide range of results here, a, a few that are in the definitely category, um, some that a large number of you actually kind of depends on how many others are on that. Am I going to be the only one seems to be the question that rules the day. Um, and uh, a variety of you also aren't interested, which is perfectly fine. So um, we'll be rolling out that uh, as, again, kind of an experiment for the, the pilot test takers who take the level two early bird um, and um, uh, be responsive to people's feedback and, and make adjustments as needed. So uh, let's get through these last few slides and then open it up to, to some more of the Q&A that um, we haven't been able to, to get to yet. So let's take a look at the timeline. So um, the level two is being opened in kind of two phases. And this is exactly how we did it with level one. Many of you are already familiar with that. Some of you aren't. So I just want to kind of lay this out for you. Um, there's this early bird program, there's early bird period. Um, where we get those first 150 to 200 test takers that really help us get good data to be able to set a reasonable pass-fail score. And, and because if you think about it, we could right now just say 75% questions correct, that's the cutoff, uh, but that's not really a, a, a reasonable way to set an exam pass-fail score because maybe Tessie and Tom and all the other experts wrote really, really tough questions and it's really hard to get a 75% correct. Or maybe they wrote much easier questions that's much more reasonable to get a 90%. Um, so we kind of have to, to go through and uh, make sure that the questions are both not too easy, not too hard, because then we won't count them for the pass-fail score, and then also make sure that there's a correlation between um, whether or not someone gets a question right or um, the whole exam, it does well on the whole exam. So um, that whole process is this early bird period, and you get some benefits being an early bird test taker. Um, and it starts tomorrow. So tomorrow, uh, the study guide will be available, registration will be available. You can go to the website and uh, sign up and, and begin studying. Uh, two weeks from now, uh, that's when we'll make the sample questions available, as I mentioned earlier. Then a couple weeks after that is when the first day the exam is offered. So this works because you can start studying now. There's no one who's going to sign up tomorrow and choose their exam day for a day later or even a week later. We find that most people spend three to four weeks studying. So we gave that kind of initial time uh, for people to get that in. And the first day you'll be able to take the exam is August 22nd. Or you'll have from August 22nd through September 30th. That's the window by which you'll be able to take the exam. Um, and to kind of offer uh, uh, those of you who are signing up as part of the early bird, you're signing up as somebody as the group who doesn't benefit from the fact that people have taken it before you. So uh, as a side benefit, we're going to offer a little exam cram webinar that first week that the exam is offered. Um, this is the opportunity for people to ask questions. We're not going to give you answers to questions, obviously. We're not going to tell you study this, not study this. But we'll be able to answer questions and make sure that you feel like you know what to expect going into your exam. Um, and so before October 1st, that's the deadline to complete the early bird exam. Um, and so being part of that uh, uh, early bird group gives you a few benefits, one of which is, is an early bird discount. So um, you get a $200 discount. The price then is $450. It's limited for about half of the people who have already taken the level one. So um, uh, those who are interested in doing this, who want to complete the exam, take advantage of the discount. I encourage you signing up earlier rather than later just so that you can take advantage of that discount. It means that you complete the exam by October 1st. So that once October 1st happens, we can do that statistical analysis that takes several weeks because we run the analysis, we get together the experts, they review every question, they eliminate the uh, questions that are invalid, um, that don't have good uh, exam properties, and then um, they say, what should a reasonable candidate expect to know? And that's the question they try and answer, and that question determines what the pass-fail score is. 
And then, like I said, they have no idea what the pass rate is. None of them know whether or not they're, they're only going to pass 60% or 80%. So that's all independent. But we need to do that analysis in October and November so that we can get the results out to the early bird group. The people who take the early bird um, will be kind of part of this uh, special group that we're going to call the first cohort of FSA credential holders. After that, anybody else who passes level one and level two, they get the FSA credential, but this first group is that first cohort, which will come with some benefits that I'll talk about in a second. But um, we also are going to have this, this special pricing uh, category through the end of 2017, or sorry, there's a typo there, 2016. If you register uh, by, in all the reviews that we did, we missed that typo, uh, register before 2017, I guess com register by 2017. Um, you, it's acknowledging the fact that many people, 300 people, signed up for the FSA credential before the level two was available. They didn't entirely know what to expect. So if they aren't able to take advantage of the early bird, we still want to give them a, a, a benefit and a discount kind of group-wide um, for uh, $550. Starting January 1st, um, 2017, that's when the normal price kicks in um, for anybody taking the exam after that. So let's look at what this first cohort of FSA credential holders will have. In addition to the $200 early bird discount, we're going to have a special section on the FSA website profiling these individuals. Um, you're also are part of this study group um, that probably uh, will, we may not be able to make it easily available to people who sign up afterwards because people, after the early bird, people just take the exam whenever they want. So some people take it in January, February, March, April, May. There's no kind of cohesive group that can be part of a study group. So you get that special access. Um, we're also, there's a soon to be announced, not yet announced, SASE conference that's happening December 1st. Um, and at that conference in New York, we're going to have a very public recognition of uh, the FSA credential holders, that first cohort, kind of acknowledging um, what they've done. Um, and we're also doing this uh, exclusive exam cram webinar um, that we won't be offering otherwise. So um, as being one of the part of those people that sign up for this early bird, part of the pilot, um, we want to make sure that you don't feel that you're just out there hanging on your own, but that you get support along the way. So that's what you get as being part of the first cohort. So um, that's it for really getting you all the information you really need to know about um, the uh, level two exam. Now we've got some questions that poured in. We've got a few minutes and I want to make sure that we uh, are able to get Tom and Tessie's uh, perspective on some of that. So one of them, um, let's, uh, let's get Tom's perspective on this. So the question is, does the curriculum address how sustainability professionals can incorporate the data into their company's 10K appropriately. Tom, what would you say to that question? I, I would say yes, it, it does aid in that analysis. Uh, the analysis of material, materiality is obviously very specific to the company and the organization. The way the test questions are written, uh, I guess I would assume that the information on, that is given to it, uh, I wouldn't assume it was uh, all material to the question, but in, in perhaps materiality to the to the organization, I would say yes. So I don't think the exam itself helps the materiality determination, but it does give a, a good view, an excellent view on how material uh, information can be evaluated, if that makes sense. Well, at least it makes sense to me. <laughs> So let's take a look. Uh, actually, Tessie, this one's directed to you. Um, how would you characterize a person's qualifications after passing level two? And can you compare the level two format and content to the rigor of the CFA and CAIA exams? So for the second part, I mean, I think that the, I'll do the second part first. They're such different exams because obviously the CFA is really about understanding things like understanding derivatives, understanding fixed income in a way and an ask that you're not going to be asked here. I think that one thing that you get comfort from if someone completes the entire FSA process is that they understand what materiality is and how it, how it from an analyst perspective and how it, how it applies to companies or rather 
again, the idea is that they should be able to complete analysis. So it gives me, it would give me some comfort that they've at least tackled the idea of materiality, understand how it relates to companies, and has some level of being able to analyze that. I think that that, but so they're very, very different asks from the other exams because those are very specific and different skill sets. I mean, obviously those are analysis as well. You have the CSA, which of course is trying to incorporate some sustainability information into the exam, but I think that the there's a very clear SASB industry standard. And so a lot of this is can you, do you understand the logic behind that and can you interpret it, can you analyze it, can you use that framework and take it forward. So I think it's a different ask than you're looking at for the CFA. I think that's, I think that's a good description. Um, and, and one thing that I would add is that CFA Kaya, there are we're all about training, you know, CFA, you're training to be a financial analyst in all of the different topics and, and scopes that you might encounter. The FSA was designed to be a little bit different. We, we heard that, and we were developing it even before the first exam even came out, and, and we were trying to determine what the scope should be. We heard that we shouldn't try and create a new silo in professional development, but we should try and show how materiality, how sustainability, how these pieces interact um, across different professional uh, groups and different experiences um, and where the pieces come together. And so that's why we designed it with kind of a variety of, of roles in mind in order to say that this can supplement your work if you're trying to understand how material sustainability information can provide an enhanced understanding of a company. So um, that's going to be relevant to some investment analysts, some portfolio managers, some corporate sustainability folks, other corporate sustainability folks or other investment analysts, it might not be relevant to. So it's not as, where the CFA is very specific to the work uh, mm -hmm. profession, like the role that you're doing, this is a little bit more about what's within the scope for your particular um, uh, work. And um, I would think of yeah, them as complementary, like if there, it's a complement to that. So obviously you wouldn't replace one process with another, but they really can be complementary. That's great. That, uh, that's exactly what I would say, too. Very complimentary. Um, we actually have uh, several questions. We're not going to get to all of them. One of them I want to address really quick. Um, so the, the level two early bird results, you do not get the results right when you finish the exam, in part because we need to make sure. So we had 75 questions. We need to make sure what are the 60 that are actually appropriate for scoring for your pass fail so that you know, we don't include ones that are too hard or, or that don't uh, provide good analysis for your performance. And then also, what would a reasonable candidate be expected to know? So we have to go through that process. It's very rigorous. It takes uh, about a couple months. So late November is when all early bird tests, all early bird candidates will receive the result. After that, everyone who takes the exam after the early bird will get the result right away, just like we have with level one. We also have one question about, um, and actually I'm going to direct this to Tom, uh, and you can speak particularly to your colleague Kelly. Um, for a non-financial professional, what are the greatest benefits? I'm a communications professional who specializes in sustainability report development. Tom, one of your colleagues also helped work on this who does kind of some of the sustainability communications for Hermel. What do you, what's your take on, on that person's question? Well, yes. Uh, our external manager uh, of communications who deals with corporate responsibility, uh, Kelly Broughton, participated in this process and she also took and passed the level one exam. And having had conversations with her, uh, the, as a communications professional, she's dealing with a lot of subject matter experts and a lot of data feeds uh, and, and helping us digest that into the, into the format, into the style. Uh, of, regardless of the communication route. As this effort, I know for her, raised her awareness of, of sustainability accounting standards, metrics analysis, and I think that's, that is going to be very valuable for, for her, myself, and anyone else who takes the exam as we start to deal with more uh, traditional metrics reporting uh, to be able to uh, apply some, some reasoning as to what the information actually means, which helps group you know, it will help the story that surrounds the, the metrics and information that's provided. So I, I think for, for those of us that are in the non-financial field, communications, sustainability on the environmental side, other sustain, corporate responsibility practitioners, uh, the process will, will 
do nothing but help us evaluate meaningful information and comparable information uh, within the industry, within the company itself. Thank you so much for weighing in on that, Tom. And um, you know, there's, there's some questions here that we didn't get to. I want to make sure that we end, you know, I wish I could say it's on time. It's about a minute over by my clock. But um, we will answer some of the questions that we got in individually to those who submitted them. I want to thank Tessie and Tom for joining us and sharing your perspectives. Um, I know that uh, I actually learned a, a bit from you guys as well, not only through this whole process, but even just over the last hour. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, and for all of you who uh, chimed in, if you have additional questions, you can reach out to us, fsa at sasb.org. Um, and if you're interested in taking advantage of that early bird uh, and being part of the first cohort, registration opens tomorrow, and that will be available on our website. So uh, thank you all for joining us, and I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thanks so much, Tessie. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone.